So hello everyone. I hope you are doing well during those alternative times. Thank you for joining me today for my talk about CGM. Care of not care of problems. This is my main agenda for the talk. I will start with some introduction about some basic concepts of the internet. Then I will explain what is CGM. Later, I will tell you why it is bad and what we can do to minimize the problems or even fix them. This is the agenda for the introduction. This is not a very technical talk, but I do cover, oh, sorry, but I do cover many topics in order to get to my point. So I hope you will keep up and learn some new things today. As mentioned, my name is Simon. I'm 34 years old. I do malware and security research for clear, sky, uh, for clear sky cyber security in Israel. And this presentation has nothing to do with this kind of work. I've been hacking and passionate about information security since the age of 13. I had a PV6 on my Windows XP with four, six, four to six tunnel in 2007. And I allegedly did some interesting things over the years. In this talk, we are going way back to the 80s, when IPv4 became a standard. We slowly progress until today to see what happened and where we went wrong. The internet was built on the end-to-end -end principle, which is simple. Data between two devices should be sent as is without any manipulation on the web. Otherwise, our connection is not private, and we can't rely on the data to be secure and authentic. This is a diagram of how end-to-end -end should look like. According to the principle, the network is only responsible for providing the terminals with connections. Any kind of intelligence should be located at the terminals. An example for such intelligence is modifying a packet header, like destination or source, Back in the 80s, computers were big and expensive and not a common commodity like today. Even at a later point, each house didn't have more than one computer. This computer wasn't necessarily connected to the internet. And if it was, it wasn't 24 seven. At some point, people had more than one computer at the house, but they had only one telephone or cable line. There was a need to connect multiple computers to the same external line. In order to do so, NAT was created. It maps multiple addresses to a single point by modifying the headers of the packets. This behavior breaks the end-to-end -end principle because it applies intelligence. But we control the NAT device, so it should be OK as long as we control it. In this diagram, we can see a home computer, which is part of a local network, trying to communicate with a server on the public internet. The NAT changes the addresses accordingly, so the router could route the packets back and forth to the right destination inside the local network. At some point, the internet became so popular, there was a fear it would be overpopulated by subscribers. This is because each subscriber should have a unique IPv4 address, and the IPv4 pool size wasn't big enough. In the days of the dial-up modems, those uh, did the funky noises when dialing, ISPs started to give dynamic IPs to subscribers. This allowed ISPs to have more subscribers than IPs, because not everyone were connected at the same time. But if there was no free IP address, you simply could dial in and use the internet until someone would disconnect or the ISP would purchase more IP addresses. The depletion was anticipated since the 80s. Today, there are great markets to buy or lease IPv4 addresses because all IPv4 space has been allocated and issued already. Let's go back to our timeline. In 94, NAT was proposed. And we all use NAT nowadays, one way or another. Only two years later, in 96, IPv6 was proposed in order to overcome the issues with IPv4 and to eliminate the need for NAT so we could restore the end to end principle of the internet. Unfortunately, we are now in 2021 
and we didn't fully adopt IPv6 yet. Instead, CGN was created, and it is widely adopted today. CGN is basically a large scale NAT that's the SP control. Each IP in this LAN belongs to a subscriber, which also might have their own controlled NAT. CGN was created because at some point, people not only had personal computers they had to connect to the internet, they had mobile phones with data plans. Those phones would dial in when internet was needed. But later on, we started to have smartphones that are 24 seven connected. All those devices need IP addresses, which mobile carriers couldn't provide. If you didn't know, 95% of mobile traffic in the world is behind CGN. If you have a smartphone, congratulations, you most likely use CGN. In this diagram of CGN, we can see the subscribers have full control over the private IP space until it leaves their home equipment and goes to the private IP space of the ISP. We don't control the carrier, not at all. Therefore, this might be risky. We can compare ISP to a bank. All customers hope the bank will keep their money safe. There are rules and regulations for that in most of the countries, but this is not the case with CGN. So what do we do? There are no IP before others is left. And CGN doesn't seem like a good solution. If you've forgotten already, in 96, IPv6 was proposed. In 98, it became a draft standard. It was meant to fix all this nonsense. IPv6 can provide a unique external IPv6 service to all your internet connected devices and restore the end-to-end -end principle of the internet. Four years ago, 2017, IPv6 finally became a standard, official standard, by the Internet Engineering Task Force. If IPv6 is so great, you would expect it to be widely adapted after four years. Unfortunately, we are in 2021. We have now internet connected cars, yet IPv6 adaptation is still low. According to Google, only a third of Google users have IPv6. A, sign, a site named whyknowipv6.com shows that less than half of Alexa top 1,000 sites support IPv6, and that less than a third of Alexa top 1 million sites support IPv6. I will quote the site out for, and will say that this is a huge shame. I would like to personally ask you at the end of this presentation, to check whether your home network support IPv6 and if it is actually enabled. CGN adaptation, on the other hand, is only growing and will continue to grow if we won't switch to IPv6. <clears throat> Except the obvious fact that it breaks the end to end principle, there are different other issues in different aspects that CGN introduced. I will elaborate on those new issues in the next slides. Now you can see how CGN deployment should look like in theory. It is meant to be deployed in dual stack. Each subscriber has a CGN IPv4 address and also a public external IPv6 address, enjoying both legacy support for IPv4 and IPv6. Sounds good, but in reality, CGNs are the Wild West. Since we don't have control over the ISP NAT device, we don't know how it is configured. They can do whatever they want without regulation. Apparently, some ISPs give only NAT IPv4 address without any option for IPv6. The logical solution would be the opposite. I haven't heard of IPv6 only ISP yet, but there are some IPv6 only hosting services. There are many posts on the internet of people complaining they have issues with running some services. Most of these people either find out for the first time they are behind the CGN and people tell them to enable IPv6 
to solve all the problems. Small portion already knows that they are behind CGN. They also mentioned that the ISP doesn't have IPv6 support and ask for advice how to overcome this issue. But I have found this one particular interesting post. One year ago, a user on Reddit asked how CGN deployment impacts the users. As we saw earlier, it does. This user claims he works in ISP and they are currently planning to deploy CGN without IPv6. This shows that also the CGN RFC clearly mentioned the deployment should be dual stack mode with transition mechanisms to IPv6. This is not necessarily how it is done in practice. On the other hand, my ISP does support dual stack, but you need to explicitly ask for it. They will tell you they don't officially support it, and the connection with by IPv6 enabled for some reason is not optimal, and you get better results with IPv6 disabled. Unfortunately, some people think that NAT is a security technique. You expose only the ports you need in the LAN addresses you want. No, 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 no. NAT is not a firewall. This is only a byproduct from the workaround for the brokenness of the end-to-end -end principle that NAT introduced. If you run legacy OS inside the NAT, IPv6 can open a Pandora box if you don't configure your uh, gateway firewall correctly. Sorry. Uh, one patient zero can infect a whole ISP with a worm. You might see worms returning big time inside CGN networks. Because that breaks the end-to-end -end principle, some applications stop working. Different techniques are introduced in order to overcome these issues. UPnP is one of those. Akamai has published a research in 2018 about a campaign that exposes SMB ports on machines behind the NAT to exploit the eternal blue vulnerability. A subscriber inside the CGN can do the same, except it won't expose the ports to the public internet. He will expose them to the CGN private IPv4 alpha space. This kind of attacks are also called hole punching attacks. CGN deployments might be vulnerable to similar attacks. And with double punching the ports, it might be possible to expose these machines to the public internet eventually. As I mentioned, CGN was supposed to be deployed with dual stack to enable smooth transition to IPv6. In practice, CGN is deployed without any regulation and sometimes without IPv6. Instead of adopting the real solution, we give live support to IPv4, although it was doomed a long time ago. On top of that, we add new internet connected devices every day, IoT, smartwatches, even cars. Some of these new devices most likely don't even support IPv6. Ask yourself, do you really want your car to be connected to IPv4 CGN? If you're not sure about your answer to my previous question, take a look at this. The Europol already identified legal problems with CGN in 2017. Before CGN, everything was simple. If a security agency would give an IP address and a date, to the ISP. The ISP would provide records of the subscriber and their internet activity. With CGN, multiple subscribers share the same IP. Does the ISP keep records of what's happening inside the CGN if there is no regulation? The quick answer is no. Here are some examples the Europol gave for cases being closed because of missing records for CGN activity. In one case with partial records, 49 innocent people were questioned. The privacy was violated because of one criminal that shared the same IP address with them on the CGN. 
What would happen if the CGNIP was shared by 1,000 subscribers? Would 999 people will be questioned without doing anything? If you think about it, cyber criminal doesn't need a VPN, he just needs a CGN to cover his tracks. If he can combine both, he can be bulletproof. As we saw in the previous slide, your privacy can be violated indirectly because of the actions of a subscriber sharing the same external IP address with other innocent subscribers. But your privacy can also be violated directly by another subscriber. Because all the subscribers are inside the huge LAN, what stops someone from doing a port scan and perform reconnaissance on other subscribers? In some cases, it is even possible to determine the approximate geolocation of another subscriber. As mentioned much earlier, the end to end principle is broken. The CGN is a black box controlled by the SP. But what do they do actually with our packets? And finally, for the conspiracy lovers, here's one for you. What if the NSA had backdoors in the CGN equipment to spy on people? Think about it. The following text is taken from a research that was done in 2016. It says there is insufficient guidelines and regulations on CGN deployments and call it a black art, which leaves the subscriber with no other choice rather than to believe that his ISP knows how to do it. Now we approach the juicy part, security issues. Some CGN equipment ships the default passwords. Does the companies that sell these devices do proper security checks for the devices? As mentioned, other subscribers can actively or passively hack us because we are on the same LAN, actively by port scanning and exposing some vulnerability or passively by a worm. Black hat hackers would want to get their foothold inside the CGN. Those networks must contain easy targets. Some network might be even full of specific vulnerable devices that are given by the ISP to all of the subscribers. Massive jackpot. Services that use IP address as additional security measure can be easily bypassed. If a hacker managed to get credentials to such service and the credentials belong to a CGN resident, the hacker simply needs to be connected to the same CGN as a resident and easily bypass this additional security check because both will have the same external IP address. In theory, to cause a DDoS to a CGN from outside of CGN should be easy. With some effort, it might be possible from inside as well. We simply need to overload the NAT table with open sessions. My ISP resets the subscriber connection each day at midnight, probably to flush all the open sessions. The DDoS impact in both scenarios is DDoS for all the CGN subscribers as it can't initiate new connections because the NAT table is full. From Blue Team perspective, Blocking a CGN IP will lead to a massive user block because of the actions of a single offender. I mentioned default passwords on CGN devices. I didn't make this up. This is an ATEN device exposed to the public internet with default password. This is only the load balancer. But this might happen with CGN equipment as well. This device is running like that for over a year. This might be still a huge problem as an issue with the load balancer most likely will affect the subscribers as well. Okay, now let's see some real life examples of what actually happens inside the CGN. We can see the same subscriber receives a different CGN IP address and is connected to different gateways. This happens each time he reconnects. 
Once again, the legal issue comes to mind. Does there spill of everything or is it just random assignment? The same thing happens with IPv6. A dynamic IP allocation is made. Once more, the issue of logging user activity is being questioned. Most likely, IPv6 logging is insufficient at the ISP level and needs to be regulated. As I mentioned, a subscriber can scan the CGN subscribers, but he also can scan the CGN equipment to potentially hack it. There is no network isolation. This is a potential that only a CGN resident has, as those devices are not accessible directly from the public IPv4 space. You might think, how bad this can be? Obviously, there would be devices with different passwords and security vulnerabilities. But this can happen on public IPv4 as well. However, CGN exposes some old risks, probably because someone thought that NAT is a security technique. We can find externally open file shares. It is like we're back to the early days of this millennium, when computers were connected directly without NAT with the file shares exposed. Today, if a hacker will find such a, he will most likely leverage into some sort of ransomware attack. Now we can see an interesting case. I will call it a voodoo. We see a printer that has an internal LAN IP, an external IPv6 address as well. But it is also somehow exposed to the private IPv4 space of the CGN although this IP is not listed anywhere on this page. This is most likely due to some sort of, mis sort of misconfiguration, but you can find similar cases in CGM networks in high numbers. At this point, I hope you understand that CGM can be problematic, but the solution is actually very simple. Upgrade to IPv6. Restore end to end principle. Upgrade to IPv6, solve IPv4 exhaustion. Upgrade to IPv6, solve crime attribution. Upgrade to IPv6, restore full control over your network. Upgrade to IPv6, experience the full power of the internet. Upgrade to IPv6, 2021, it's time to upgrade. And yes, I wrote upgrade to IPv6 six times on purpose. Okay, we have learned that we all use CGN in one way or another. Unfortunately, some of the CGN deployments are broken. CGN is basically the insider threat for residential networks. Due to COVID-19, many people work from home. Some of you might have a CGN at home. As I showed earlier, there are security issues with CGN. This should be considered as an additional risk factor to working from home. There is no real benefit from CGN to a subscriber, maybe to the ISP. But remember, CGN is not a permanent solution. It was intended as to be a transitional technology until we fully switch to IPv6. So let's embrace IPv6. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, you're welcome to ask questions in work adventure or uh, find me on Twitter. Hope you enjoyed my talk. Thank you.